Welcome to episode 17 of Eat NATO for Breakfast. Today we have a very special program. We are broadcasting in two languages with translation into English and Spanish. If you're watching us through People's Dispatch English, you'll be hearing me in the voice of somebody else, our interpreter, Sarah, because today I'm going to be speaking Spanish. And if you're watching the program through the YouTube of the Party of the European Left, you'll be surprised to hear Francisca speak Spanish. Many thanks to People's Dispatch and PIE for making this possible. In the previous 16 programs, we've spoken about history, the new Cold War, the ecological and feminist struggle for peace, and the specific impacts of war and NATO on the environment and health. But we felt that we needed to go deeper into one of the fundamental players of NATO and of this international crisis, which is the European Union. To that end, today we again have a program full of women who will speak to us about Europe's role in this war and in today's geopolitics. We have two prominent leaders of the European Left Party, Maite Moller, who's vice president and responsible for international relations, and Claudia Haidt, coordinator of the EL Peace and Security Working Group. Today, we have two Spaniards and two Germans. Welcome, Maite and Claudia. How are you today? And where are you speaking to us from? Are you looking forward to eat NATO for breakfast with us? Firstly, thank you so much for the invitation. It really is a pleasure to be with you. It's always a pleasure to see how women are empowered and are speaking of such, in inverted commas, masculine subjects. I'm in Pamplona, which is where I normally live, uh, between Pamplona and Brussels. And I am, yes, looking forward to eat NATO for breakfast, but I know I'm going to have to have some liver salts afterwards to be able to digest it properly. Well, about you, Claudia? <laughs> good morning. And yes, I would like to eat NATO for breakfast too, and it could be hard to digest. So Maite is absolutely right. I'm talking to you from Stuttgart in the south of Germany. And by the way, Stuttgart is host to two major command structures of the U.S. military. Um, it's one on the one hand side, it's the European command. And the European command, maybe you know it, maybe you don't, is uh, the U.S. military's uh, supreme command for uh, the European Union countries, but also for Russia. And Stuttgart is also host to AFRICOM. This is the African supreme command structure of the U.S. military. So those are the two only su supreme command structures of the U.S. military outside of the U.S., And this might give you an indication on how um, good allies the Germans are um, if they are host to those um, command structures. And uh, me as part of the peace movement and of the left party, I'm always paying regular visits to those command structures in order to tell them that they are not as welcome as they think they might be. Yes, but who, the people that are welcome are ourselves uh, to together have the NATO for breakfast. Francisca, I can see you once again drinking a, your coffee out of your uh, Eat Breakfast for NATO cup. How are you today? Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for organizing all the complicated uh, arrangements around translation. And no, I'm not drinking coffee anymore. I've switched to herbal tea. It's been, to say the least, it's been exciting enough. I really need to calm down and calm my nerves. So no more coffee for me for a while. Um, thank you, Claudia, and thank you, Maite, for joining us today. I think um, Claudia already jumped right into the subject. We need to look at, we need to look at the role of the European Union, but also even more specifically, the role of the different countries. We have tried to do so a little bit in the past, already looking at speaking with people from Norway. We will be speaking with people from Italy. So we are looking into the countries as well to find out where they're standing. Today, it'll be the European Union session. Um, so the war in the Ukraine has sort of brought into the sharp focus 
the global situation in many ways. We clearly see that there's a division in the world, again, in the 20th century, like in the two blocks, a new Cold War. We have NATO on the one side playing a central role, and somehow the agendas between the United States and Russia uh, are sort of uh, playing out. And in the middle is Europe, not only geographically, but also politically, because the European Union is related in political terms and social and commercial well, in political and social terms a lot with the US, but also in commercial terms a lot with Russia. So how do we see this role of the European Union in this global situation? What is the weight of the European Union in all this? And how has, or why, to some extent, it does it seem that NATO is really determining the conversation or is strengthened in Europe, is really playing a much more, suddenly a much more prominent role after it seemed for a while like it, you know, it was a superfluous uh, military alliance. Maybe we can start with that question. Thank you very much. Well, this question, I could speak about until the cows come home, there, because there are several questions and they're all key, the ones that you've raised. And as this is breakfast, let's be as quick as possible. European construction, this is the issue that we need to talk about. To build a European Union without, including Russia, was stupid because Europe isn't everything except for Russia. It's everything, including Russia. Europe geographically is so. That was a big blunder doing that. Well, economically, I hardly need to comment on that. But right from the outset, it should have been a construction of Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals. So we started with a blunder. If we'd built a European Union, including the biggest country in Europe then today, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. That's point number one. So it's key that we show our shame. So our shame for not having done this in Europe. How can it be that in Finland, such an important decision, which is to join NATO, a country, Finland, which has been an example together with Sweden and others of a balance, just in five minutes, overnight, decides to join uh, NATO without even consulting its population. This is a complete lack of democracy. Even in Spain, a referendum was held to decide whether to join NATO or not. I know it was a complicated thing to do, but what is happening now? The EU is strengthening, is encouraging people to join, other countries to join NATO. They're not saying that openly, but in a veiled way, they are encouraging countries that are not in NATO to join NATO. And I don't want to say that I'd like to eat NATO for breakfast, but actually don't think that I haven't realized that this militarized version of European Union is uh, completely useless and also completely dependent on the United States. Claudia, in your opinion? Claudia, your well, opinion? Well, as Maite already has pointed out, we are talking about a militarized European Union. And if we talk about European Union, we have to consider the foundations on which it is built. And um, you might know that um, the legal foundation of the European Union at the moment is the so-called Treaty of Lisbon. Mm -hmm. And this Treaty of Lisbon came into force in 2009, and it's the basis for developments in security and foreign policies and so on. And um, 
you might have noticed that there are some significant changes we have to see in European Union just now. And um, for example, this treaty includes something totally strange, at least for me, namely the obligation of member states to, and now I quote, um, progressively improve their military capabilities. So, so from my point of view, it's the only, um, it's not a country, but the, the only um, state building or community of state, states, which is actually founded on a legal obligation, on a constitutional obligation, even to improve its military spending, to spend more and more money to become stronger and stronger. This is totally crazy. And, and now, actually, um, Germany is copying this uh, framework of constitutional obligation to improve military spending. And um, we've already talked about this in, in, in um, other um, issues of Eat NATO for Breakfast. But Germany now is proposing to spending 100 billion euros just to improve its armament. and this 100 billion euros are to be put into the German constitution so that they are really have to be used even by future governments for buying tanks and ammunition and warplanes and fighter jets and whatever. So what we are seeing now is started by European Union, but is actually being um, implemented by more and more countries, for example, at the moment in Germany. And if we are talking about the European Union, actually, we have to talk about Germany. You know, for a long time, Germany has been the dominant economic power within the European Union. And it had catastrophic implications during the austerity crisis, the euro crisis, um, this dominant uh, role of Germany. And now we've also seen an increasing political dominance of, of German policies within the European Union. And now this is actually complemented by a stronger military role. And if Germany is actually spending 2% of its GDP for um, military reasons, and this has a global, a global implication. With this 2% of the GDP, Germany becomes the third largest spender globally after the US, after China. In future, we will see Germany. And this is not something I'm proud of. Coming from Germany, it's something I'm really actually ashamed of. And uh, Germany that is going to be that strong militarily is normally not good news for neighbors and global <laughs> and seeing it on a global scale. So I will do everything to stop this. And um, I hope we find lots of allies for this. But we are talking now about the European Union. And Germany will be also militarily the strongest part within this European Union. So we just are not talking only about an alliance of states with the European Union, but we are talking about uh, an alliance of states with a dominant power or two dominant powers, Germany and France, um, side by side. And um, we know that both countries don't have a past um, which is dominated by, let's say, peaceful foreign policies. <laughs> Germany, and you, I don't have to talk about world wars and with France, you know, it's colonial past and even colonial presence, neo-colonial presence. And this is forming the foreign policy of the European Union. So, so what we are seeing now is a very militaristic European Union. Some of this militarism is still ambition and not reality, but this ambition is really founded on a lot of money. So it be can become reality. 
And um, does this make the European Union into an independent player? This is what some of our politicians tell us. Hey, it's going to be an independent European Union, independent from NATO, independent from NATO. But in order to be independent, you have to be our aims. You have to be our goals. You have to use our means. And none of this is true. So what we are seeing with the European Union, European Union that it is working side by side with NATO. It has the same aims. And it's not an alternative. We are going to talk about this, but it's just a very bad copy of what NATO is. And it's not a European Union I want. Bueno, pues yo creo que, que Claudia ha dado como I un think poco Claudia has set the scene of what we want to talk about now. She spoke about ambition. She spoke about the European Union ambition, but I'd like to actually carry on talking about what Maite said at the end of her intervention, rather this ambition also follows what the US is aiming for. So could you say a few words about whether the European Union is something in its own right? Does it have its own independent foreign affairs? And if not, why not? And also because many of us would like a different kind of European project, such as Claudia, what can we do to be uh, to chart our own destiny? So first of all, Maite and then Claudia. Let's see what you have to say. I think that Claudia has, yes, started to set the scene. I'm just going to talk about two specific issues. Firstly, from what I've seen as a, a older lady who's seen how the European Union has uh, developed and I've followed it closely because I'm in charge of international relations for the European left and have been for the last 20 years. I don't know what you think about this and it's almost a question to you, but the way I see it, there are increasingly worse uh, overseas affairs uh, representatives of the EU. A few years ago, we were complaining about our representative. What could we say now about Mr. Borrell? I don't know what's happening in the European Union today, but what started out being a very interesting project, because it was a very interesting project, we were creating something rational in the European Union, and I supported that idea, but this rational construction of the European Union should have its own policies, its own independent policies, economic, overseas, and where it has less of its own independent projects, and I think Claudia said that quite clearly, is everything that's related to uh, militarization and foreign affairs. Because here in this field, we are being completely controlled and led by the United States. So the foreign affairs policy of the European Union, for me, is something that makes me once again, question and ask myself, what's the European Union for? And the second issue, there's also a, a problem of the states that make up the EU, or rather the governance, governments of the EU, because otherwise it's just a kind of a, a circus, it's a kind of theatre where a lot of other uh, countries are being harmed. For example, Cuba, criticising Cuba and criticising other people and other countries. So the European Union has a problem, is a really serious problem, which is who's ruling uh, Germany? Who's leading France? Who's in the government of all the different European Union countries when, for example, Pedro Sanchez to, goes to Ukraine to visit Zelensky? These images of our governments, of the European Union governments, for me are very concerning. It would seem that the only thing... Uh, only people that are saying things with common sense are Pope Francis and sometimes China and Cuba as well. So whilst our states, the states that 
uh, members of the European Union don't have progressive governments, governments that are against war, that are, are against militarization, and that, that in favor above all of peace, then the European Union is just a complete disaster. And, and it would be better if it didn't have any uh, overseas affairs uh, policy. So we've got these dependent relationships. Thank you. Well, I think I'm just going to follow up on what Maite is saying, <laughs> if it's okay. And um, what, what we are asking ourselves is if European Union actually is something which is acting on its own with its own values with regard to its foreign policy. And yes, of course, European Union is different from the US. But if you look on the foreign policy, actually, um, the US government should write a thank you note to Putin for um, bringing the alliance closer together than within the last 10 or 20 years. If in the last 10 or 20 years, we've seen some small maneuvers of doing a little bit different things there and so, but what Putin actually managed is to enforce the structure of NATO again, to make it stronger than ever before. So actually, if we are talking about rational policies, I don't see them within the US government, within NATO, within the European Union, but I don't also don't see them in Moscow and with what Putin is now doing with his kind of foreign policies. Actually, it looks like two trains are running towards one another and all of them um, pretending it's not my fault, it's the other one who is rising, it, uh, who is running towards me. And I have to keep on because if I don't keep on, then the other will win and this is moral, bankrupt moral bankruptcy. So we are talking about morals and not about policy and not about the people who will suffer by this kind of policies. And um, there actually has been pressure for a very long time by the US on its European allies to increase their military spending and to increase their uh, military ambitions, level of ambitions. And well, this was, okay, something happened, but not as much as the US government actually had wanted. What we've seen in the last years is actually that um, every crisis was used to increase the military spending and to increase the level of ambition for military activities. And now we see, at least for the moment, the final step, the war against Ukraine, which cemented the alliance, made it even more into a strong military actor, which is using this a moment in time not to find ideas how to overcome the confrontation, but actually to implement uh, policies which will deepen the rift, which will make the world, world into an even more dangerous place. And it's like a militaristic reflex, but it's not a reflex, it's policy. It's policy which has long been um, yeah, provided for, um, but now has the moment to be implemented. And the reason for the US to put this pressure on its European allies to improve their military spending is actually that the US doesn't want to change its policy in Europe, but it wants to do less for the same policy and um, be, be free to, to um, implement pressure in the Pacific region towards China. So we see actually a continuation of US policies, which are now being implemented by its European allies more and more, and um, leaving the US free to put pressure on China over the Pacific. So we don't see this in, in recent years. I've seen the idea that the US is being a little less present in the European countries as something positive, and I still see it. But what we now see is that it's uh, 
yeah, yeah, uh, doing bringing his the European allies to do the dirty work more and more and um, make the world into an even more dangerous place. And we really have to make a break with this, not uh, reacting on provocations, on war, on suffering, as we see in Ukraine now, by um, preparing even more wars and even more suffering, but by starting to be rational and prepare for peace and not, not for war. Thank you, Claudia. I think you raised a number of very, very interesting points. Um, you say not react to the military, like not react to war with a military reflex of just jumping to the conclusions. One of the things that we have seen and one of the things that is being um, undertaken by the EU and by other country, by countries around the globe, but not by no means all countries, uh, is a different type of pressure, which is the whole idea of sanctions. Um, so we've seen um, that in, in Germany, it was Robert Habeck, but I guess also Josep Borrell, they all proposed that the Europeans should just turn down the heat so we could live without Russian gas and oil for a while because this was now, you know, for the war effort and this was going to go and bring, bring the Russians or bring, bring the Russians to heel. Um, the, the idea of sanctions is a very, very tricky one. We see that it will likely harm uh, many, many countries and the people, we have, you know, an impact on food and energy security in countries actually from Germany to South Africa. So it is not only, it is actually global, um, this crisis. Um, and we also see that, for example, the investment of EU countries in US liquefied gas has increased. Uh, so we also, when we look at sanctions, whether they're effective is one question, but I guess another question that we need to ask ourselves is who benefits from these sanctions? And I would like, I would like you to comment a little bit on this, on, on the idea of sanctions as somehow uh, a more peaceful way of solving, um, yeah, solving the two trains racing towards each other. Uh, is that actually, is that, sent, is that boycott against Russia even sustainable? Are these types of, are these sanctions really harming the people that they should? I mean, again, I actually know the answer to that. That seems like a, to that, at that moment, almost a silly question. But I would like you, if possible, to comment a little bit on this aspect of, um, let's, let's call it what it is, of this type of war uh, theater that uh, is also taking place. If you could, Claudia, please. Yes, I, I'm really convinced that what we are seeing now with the sanctions which are implemented, for example, by European Union, is actually a continuation of warfare and a continuation of uh, building up the blocks just by other means. It's um, not military in itself, but the implications, the destruction it causes, the deaths it will cause, actually are on a level with a war. So this is economic warfare, what we are seeing now. And just to be clear, there are some sanctions I don't have a problem with. To not export weapons is actually a kind of sanction. So yes, I'm in favor of sanctioning every country or at least every country which is um, engaged in warfare not to send weapons, not to export weapons. It's a sanction I'm fine with. I'm also fine with, uh, let's uh, say, um, using the luxury yachts of oligarchs to make them into lifeboats. Okay, and um, to if we use the big mansions of oligarchs, not only the Russian ones, we also have some Ukrainian oligarchs to use them to get flats and good living for people. So also no problem from my side. But if we talk about sanctions, we have widespread effects like the sanctions on oil and gas. We have to be very clear that they are causing actually more harm than they are useful and they won't help the people in Ukraine. You know, um, the sanctions the EU is implementing just now are not short-term sanctions. 
We see it by the question that some of the EU countries only have to implement them in two years or in three years. So it's not about the short-term help for Ukrainian people. It's um, about the restructuring of economic um, connections and of economic cooperation. And this economic cooperation is um, being more or less stopped or is on the way to being stopped between the Western and Middle European Union countries and um, Eastern Europe. And also, um, well, with China, it's not possible because <laughs> the links are too strong, but at least the links with Russia are really now being destroyed by this, um, by this phase. And we are talking really about um, a European Union which is doing everything not to be a bridge to Russia, but to building up new walls. And economic cooperation can be part of a bridge building process. And we actually see a frenzy of sanctions in the moment which don't stop with economic, um, with economic sanctions but they are continuing with cultural sanctions. They continue um, with stopping, um, stopping ways in which people from different countries can cooperate with one another. You know that there is this um, concept of twin cities. There's a city in Germany cooperating with a city in Russia. And um, really a, a big part of those twin cities have now stopped their cooperation. It's, it's crazy. In, in a time like this, you have to continue talking if you want a foundation for peace. So what I now see is only foundations for future wars, for future um, confrontation, and no foundation for future cooperation. And actually, the ones who are going to bleed for this are especially in the global south. We already see in Egypt, in, in Tunis, in, in many countries in Africa, in Latin America, in East Asia, we see a problem with hunger with people not being able to buy what they need to, to um, survive. This is a huge, huge problem. And I don't see any pressure of the European Union to free the ships which are loaded up with grain in Ukrainian harbors. harbors. There is no pressure on this. There's pressure on a lot of other things, but no pressure to actually help those who are in need. So... Uh, my my um, take on the situation is that European Union is actually only acting in those areas of policies in which they are actually making the problem stronger and deepen the problem and it's not really active on those areas where they could actually make a huge, huge difference on, on a global scale. And you... To make my final point, you can see the permanent nature of the sanctions of the restructuring of economic um, cooperation by the fact that the sanctions which are decided on now are not conditioned. They are not conditioned to withdrawal of troops or not conditioned to ceasing hostilities. They are just implemented full stop. So if they would be for people in Ukraine, they would be conditioned to the cessation of war. And this isn't happening. Bueno, vemos que hay muchas cosas que está pasando y muchas que... All sorts of things are happening as we've seen and many things that aren't happening. But what we are seeing is that this is unsustainable. All these studies on energy and food security say we're heading for disaster. And also the words of Borrell, which Francesca mentioned, it seems to be forcing civilians to just actively boycott uh, Russia from our homes. So we seem to be obliged to take part in this war. But this situation in Europe, I think we all agree, is It shows all the different ways that it's affecting it. And like all crises, there's also this need to seek strange alliances. We've seen, for example, how in the Middle East, with the support of the Mujahideen, um, and in Europe, if you remember, 
But in this dangerous context, sometimes there seems to be this naturalization of the extreme right in the European Union. And I'm really, really interested, Martin, in your opinion on this. The extreme right already uh, promotes hatred, racism, uh, the limitation of rights, and representatives of the extreme right are increasing in number in national governments and in the European Union. Recently, you held some very interesting talks about that, talks entitled No Pasaran. We're going to put up a link for everybody that's listening to us if you'd like to have a look at that. But this violent situation is also being mixed in with sending weapons to Ukraine. And also, of course, in Ukraine, there are also organized, militarized, extreme right forces. So you're sending out weapons, you don't know where they're going to end up. And then there's this naturalization of uh, violent replies. Can you say a little bit about that, Maite? One of the most serious consequences of this war you called it the naturalization. And I'd say the whitening of the extreme rate right in Ukraine. Laundering it, as it were. I mean, uh, the leaders there are dressed in military fatigues. And military fatigues and a little bit arrogant. You know, here I am. We know who he is. We've been in Kiev. We visited Ukraine, of course, before the war broke out. And we saw that in Ukraine, the government is an extreme right wing government, as is the Hungarian government. It's an extreme uh, right or right extremes, however you want to call it. And look at what's happening in Poland. Poland and Hungary are both in the European Union, and I've not seen any sanction against these countries who forbid homosexuality being spoken about in schools, or the idea that Poland has to put an end to abortion. Nobody's sanctioning that. So... It's almost like we're laundering and naturalizing, as you call it, uh, the extreme right, this gradual naturalization, and it's nauseous. And I want to return to what I was saying before. The problem is that the European Union is just a sum of heads of states and presidents. These are the ones who are taking decisions. Economic decisions are taken by the ministers of EU countries, others as well. They're not taken in the European Parliament. Major decisions are taken by governments, individual governments of the European Union. So it's a, constra a construction of the European Union that, that has failed at its roots. And I'd go even further than that. I think Claudia has said this um, a few minutes back. Who would have imagined that in Spain, after a dictatorship until 1975, that today, this morning, seven o'clock in the morning, that there's an extreme right-wing party and it's a powerful uh, party and a, a great deal of potential. And they're, they're completely shamefaced. They don't have any problem mm, insulting people. Valtonic may end up being thrown into jail for having um, criticized the former king. And these parties, this party is already governing in a region of Spain together with the popular parties. So it's not just a matter of laundering them. It's just that they've been completely uh, integrated into, they've been normalized. I mean, it's only a few days ago in relative terms that there was a world war. 
And now we've got Madrid in a situation of more than 40% of people that are working are uh, voting for the right and very, very high abstention levels in France as well. What are we going to see what's happening in France and what's going to happen in the legislative elections? But at the end of the day, this laundering or naturalization of extreme right is becoming something completely normal. And this is a fact. It's not something that might happen in the future. No, no, it's already happened and it's here to stay. And I want to finalize by saying sanctions, and please allow me just this, Sanctions are already always paid by civilians. So you've got, on the one hand, uh, the extreme right on the up. On the other hand, sanctions, whenever we feel like using them, we use them. What we're doing with that is we're getting in Europe a situation in which there's a lack of democracy because people really don't care anymore. The case of NATO joining Finland is also a lack of democracy. And what does that help? It feeds the uh, extreme right. And I don't want to mention the Eurovision Song Contest here, because I think that's just uh, represents such levels of degeneration that a U Eurovision Song Festival and what you see in the television about that You just win against Russia. That's it. First, Russia isn't allowed to take part in the competition. This is a lack of democracy. And a lack of democracy in my, uh, where I come from, is called extreme right. That's what lack of democracy means where I come from. Thank you, Maite. Um, I think the next, I think as far as, as all the contradictions and also the deficits that have been listed in the show that we've talked about, the contradictions of increased military spending of, uh, for, you know, within, the, within, the, uh, within Europe, like the controversial European army project, PESCO and Frontex, and all of these incredible, incredible contradictions, also some of it very much related to what Maite is calling a lack of democracy. Um, we can, speak a lot about what are these contradictions and deficits. I think I would like for our, for our, I think it's the last question of the day because we're already running out of time again, as it always happens when we get into an interesting conversation that we want to continue and continue because only, I don't know, sometimes only halfway through the show do we realize where do we need to go with this and where do we want to go. So we never have enough time, but hopefully um, we will make time perhaps in Madrid, that would be great. Um, if we all meet there during the uh, counter summit that is being prepared. But what is my, my question is, listing the deficits and contradictions is one thing, but we have the pleasure to be here with people who are actually in the uh, European left and who are in the places where, I don't know, civilians and citizens might turn to and say, what do we do? How do we go about this? So what can we, what can we propose? What can we work on together? Um, how do we bring things back together? Because, for example, what Maite was just saying about Poland and Hungary, um, I sometimes wonder about choices. What are the choices for these people? So before we say they all vote right because they're illiberal people who, you know, what is a good left alternative for them? Where can we provide? How does the left provide this alternative and be an alternative? Um, and so I want to... I hope that this is a this is meant as a positive question. I hope that we can end on a positive note of like how do we work together? How do we um, how do we challenge our strength? And um, yeah, so I would like to give the word to Maite and uh, Claudia for you know a few more minutes to please help us you know work on like make a proposition, help us with a proposal that we can join and work on together. Thank you. What a complicated question that is.
I believe that the left and ecological and progressive uh, forces that question current economic models need to unite. We need to unite in some countries that's being achieved. I think Spain is an interesting example, as is France. It's a very interesting example after having been through those uh, presidential elections as well, the progressive and left-wing and green forces have actually argued much, with each, much more with each other than, than with opposing forces, but they've managed to achieve something. And the Cubans, the Cubans say in these things, united in diversity. So that's the, the project that I purchase. But I want to say something to you, Francesca, which I think is what you're trying to uh, tell us to do. What is our goal? What is the goal here? The key goal at the moment is peace. Peace. It's a key goal. And what's more, it doesn't unite all of us. We're not all united in peace. It only unites those that are anti-militarist, and environmentalists, those uh, that are anti-militarists and feminists, for example. The issue of peace is a key axis that does unite, but people, some people will be left out, and those that are left out, we know who they are. And I'm not referring here to the extreme right. I'm referring to rights, right wings. You can put any other adjective before right that you want to. This needs to be a debate with social movements, with unions, with everybody, so that it's not just an institutional unity, because what we need is unity from the bottom upwards, from the grassroots level. So the issue of peace, peace has always been key. But the thing is, we're very divided. If you look at all the different uh, calls that are out there for the rest of May and June, there are all sorts of calls for peace, but they're all different. And we need to talk about that. We need to say, look, okay, great. We have this vision, this is our view of the path to peace, and this is ours. But at a given moment in time, we need to bring together political spaces, people that are in grass movements so that we can all together come together and build peace. That's the only way to get the world to change. And if we don't understand that we need to uh, leave outside the 25% or the 20% that separates us, we, sometimes we we just start handing out banners. We have our own sort of slogans and our banners. Well, no, you need to get more people involved. You don't need to uh, say that, oh, I'm the one that's most uh, fighting for peace. We need to unite. We need to work together. Stop looking at what separates us. Because as you quite rightly said, Francesca, this summit not against NATO but in favor of peace because although okay it's against NATO but it should be a, a peace uh, summit and this should be the place where we should all come together and with that carry on being determined to work together together because otherwise we're gonna still end up being separate uh, trade union forces, political forces that are fringe forces facing up an enormous, great, big enemy. Thank you. Yeah, well, let me continue from where my tail uh, left. Um, and um, for me, it's especially interesting that within the last two years, we have seen that everything is possible. Within the corona pandemic, we've seen that it is possible, even in our world of today, to stop everything just now if you want it on a political level. And within the last weeks and months since the beginning of the war against Ukraine, we've seen that there is money. 
the 100 billion we already talked about in Germany was we never seem to have enough money to fight climate change. Although it's much more dangerous than Putin could ever be because it's got the potential to destroy everything on earth that we see. So if there is the political will, we can actually yeah, decide everything politically. This is what we have seen, even if it wasn't to the best within the last two years sometimes for people, but we've seen that political decisions can be made. And the TINA principle that there is no alternative actually should, should never be used as an argument after those years. But we should only ask if, it, if there is a political will to change something. And we actually also have seen that it is possible to welcome people, to welcome refugees. With people from Ukraine, it obviously wasn't as big as a problem as with people from other regions of the world. So, so we see that societies are able to change, able to um, do things um, if they want to. And if we use this energy to, on the one hand side, fight climate change, to um, tackle all the essential crisis which are globally on the agenda or should be on the agenda like hunger or illnesses and so on we actually could achieve a lot and it's clear that all the global problems can only be um, solved if people on the globe work together and if we start our policies with people and not with governments we have a good first stepping stone and therefore it's good that if NATO um, heads of state are meeting in Spain, but also people from different countries are meeting and showing NATO is not acting in our interest, is not helping to solve the problems which are on the table. But we are part of the solution. NATO is part of the problem. And this might sound idealistic. And I know that people like Putin will not disappear tomorrow. But what NATO is just doing is self-fulfilling prophecy, is helping to get people like Putin stronger. Um, they themselves um, act as a role model for, for people like Putin. All the, yeah, all the things that uh, we see now with Putin actually have been in some ways already, ways he's, he's um, working on just now have already been worked by NATO states. And I don't want to apologize for him, not at all. What he's doing is a crime, is a war crime, he should be punished for it. But it is really a difference if people are saying this or if governments who are responsible for millions of people within, for example, the war of terror are saying um, this is a crime. So, so we have to really talk about um, who is putting what kind of moral standards to what kind uh, of developments. And what we're seeing is really an increase on hypocrisy and we have to go down again and put the same standards and our same um, ideas to whoever is acting. And we expect of the governments of the NATO states to do everything to prepare for peace and not for war. Someone, I don't know who said that we have to prepare for war with the same and even more intensity than people who are preparing for war. So we not only have to wage war, we have to wage peace and do it with great intensity. We have to prepare it, found our alliances and really put peace first. Peace with other nations and peace with the, the environment. This is a big task, but I'm really optimistic that we can achieve it. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia and Maite, for having spent some time with us today. We've all from our homes and from our towns find it really difficult to understand what is happening in Europe 
and what European institutions and European policies are all about. I know Mighty is always very good at explaining to us how the council works, how the parliament works, because we need to analyze and see, as Mighty said, what, what is this project that we want to create? We all need to think about political will and democracy. Of course, without alliances, that's impossible. We need to think about immigrants. We need to think about what's happening with uh, women's rights and LGTBI communities, what's happening with racism, what's happening with extreme rights, because peace isn't just a lack of war. It's the fact that social justice exists in our lives. We will carry on working. We do work united. We'll carry on doing so. And I'm hoping that we can carry on seeing each other and building uh, upon what we're working in Madrid from the 24th of 26th of June, thanks to the interpreters, thanks to Vishad, our producer from People's Dispatch, and of course, uh, all those people that have made it possible to have this first bilingual episode of our program. I want to mention our next episode we're really really happy because in the next episode we're going to have two very important uh, guests cosmos musumale and akende who are going to talk to us about the situation in zambia and the advance of military bases in africa and the role of africa in the new cold war and global nato and i'm sure Things will uh, crop up uh, related, as Claudia said, to French colonialism. So we'll see you next week. Let's carry on building. Weapons will not save us. Let's together build this peace alternative. Thank you very much. <laughs>